Hello and welcome to this, the, the third in the Historic Pubs of Wales series of videos. In each of these videos, we try and explore a moment in Welsh history and look at it from the perspective of one of our oldest and most interesting pubs. And today, we're coming to you from a suburb of the national capital. We're at the Church Inn here in Llanishan. There are plenty of people who will tell you that the Church Inn is the oldest pub in Cardiff, that the building dates back to the 14th century. I'm not totally convinced by that because it was listed in 1975 and the listing describes it as an 18th century vernacular house. There was undoubtedly a building on this site before then and Clinician has been here since the 6th century but as it was a different building does that qualify? For whatever reason people get sentimental about pubs in ways they don't about any other type of business. So let's say for the sake of argument I took a lease out on this shop behind me here and opened a butcher's. And then after I opened it, I discovered that 200 years earlier, there had been a butcher's shop on this site. Well, if I put a sign up saying established 1822, people would think I was taking the mick. But for some reason, with a pub, that is perfectly acceptable. So however you carve it up, claims that Oliver Cromwell might have stayed here, probably a little bit unlikely. Although, fun fact, um, his mother was born in Whitchurch, which is another suburb of Cardiff, no more than a mile away from here. And as a young boy, he was believed to have spent time on the family estate. So who knows, he could well have come to Phoenician. We know for certain that he was in the Cardiff area on the 6th of May, 1648, because he was at that time a general in the new model army, and he led the Parliamentarian forces into the Battle of St. Fagans. So who knows, maybe he stopped by for a pint on his way home. An altogether more verifiable claim, and a far better story, relates to that golden-voiced Welsh politician and future Prime Minister, David Lloyd George. As much as people get hot under the collar about how much money politicians seem to earn these days, back in the 19th century, serving MPs were not paid at all. This meant that the only people who could afford to serve as MPs were the heirs of wealthy families who had personal fortunes to live off. Well, not so David Lloyd George. His father was a schoolmaster and his origins were humble. So the only way he could sustain himself as an MP was if people and organisations were prepared to support him with patronage. In the constituency he represented of Caernarvon, one group of people who were passionate supporters were the Methodists, and their ranks and coffers were growing fast. But they preached a very clear message of temperance and refraining from drink, something an ardent boozer like Lloyd George might have found hard to swallow. However, they agreed to fund him if in return he would petition the government to make drinking intoxicating liquor on the Sabbath in Wales as much a crime as it was a sin. So in 1881, the Welsh Sunday Closing Act was passed, prohibiting by law the sale of alcohol in pubs in Wales on a Sunday. Incidentally, this was landmark legislation, as it was the first time since Henry VIII passed the Act of Union back in 1536 that a law was passed treating England and Wales differently, something that set a precedent, making devolution possible. As you might imagine, it did not go down well with a lot of people in Wales who liked a pint on a Sunday. Many tried to find ways around the law through loopholes. For example, the legislators did not want to penalise travellers in need of refreshment, so they built in an exclusion that allowed people to buy alcohol on a Sunday if they could prove they were on a long journey and were at least 10 miles from home. This led to quite a famous racket which started by an entrepreneurial young man called Thomas Williams of Riddle in North Wales. He chartered a coach that left Riddle mid-morning and drove local revellers the 10 miles to the Plough Inn on the edge of St Asaph. Here they could get their fill of beer within the scope of the law, then at the end of the day they would be carted home having had a skinful. This racket was known to the people of St Asaph as the four in hand from Rill as that was the quantity of beer each passenger would buy on arrival at the plough. The children of St Asaph soon cottoned on that these visitors were a soft touch for money, so they would run behind the cart as it left the plough for Rill, singing old Welsh songs on top of their voices. The sentimental old soaks on board would feel a tug on their heartstrings and would toss coins out to the children as they trundled off. Schemes like these popped up all over Wales as people tried to find 
ways of exploiting the loopholes in the law. So the powers that be decided to take steps to try and stamp them out. And then in June 1895, none other than David Lloyd George himself was sent to Cardiff on a fact-finding mission to see how well these rules were being implemented. A newspaper article in the Western Mail claimed that they had dressed in a, quote, totally disreputable manner, unquote, in order to avoid being recognised. So it was, off they went on their tour of Cardiff pubs on that warm and sunny Sunday afternoon. At first, it looked like things were going well, and that they were going to be able to return to London telling of a success story. Nothing seems to be going on in the pubs in the centre of town and Canton, and at the Cow and Snuffers in Tland of North, all they were offered was a glass of lemonade. Oh, if only they called it a day at the Cow and Snuffers. Then Lloyd George could have returned to London with nothing but good news. However, he pushed his luck. He went to the church inn in Llanishan. I don't want to dilute what happened next. So these are the exact words which were spoken by one of the men who went on that tour of Cardiff with Lloyd George on that fateful day. As we approached, we noticed about 50 yards from the house, three men standing beside some inanimate object on the roadside. It was a man sleeping off the effects of drink. So possibly not the best start then. The companion continued, the door was wide open and business was brisk. There was not many people in the bar, but there was a good deal of beer being carried to another room. Lloyd George himself said, I found a good deal of drinking taking place in those villages, more especially at Llanishan. There were people there drinking beer in the church inn. I saw one man swinishly drunk on the roadside. Swinishly drunk, that's, that's probably pretty drunk. Um, but for whatever reason, when he returned to London, he decided to let sleeping dogs lie because the summary of his visit was, speaking generally, I did not see much drunkenness. So there we have it. A would-be prime minister of this country trying to fudge the issue on whether or not a booze-up took place. Happened in 1895. Imagine if something like that was to happen today. So there you have it. The church in Inflanition. And the time it played host to David Lloyd George, and no one was drinking beer here, honest. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. As I mentioned from the outset, it's part of a series. Uh, I've already uploaded one about uh, the Plough and Harrow in Monk Nash. There's another one about the New Inn in Merthyr Mawr and the Tale of Cap Cork. There'll be plenty more coming soon. So please uh, subscribe to this YouTube channel so you get notifications of when new videos have been uploaded, and you can follow the story of Wales told from the perspective of our ancestors as they stood at the bar. This story, and countless others like it, about Wales's oldest and most interesting pubs, come from this book, which is available uh, from Amazon, from most independent bookshops, and from my own website, and there is a link to that at the end of this video. It's called Historic Pubs of Wales. It charts the history uh, of Wales from the viewpoint of 89 of our most interesting pubs, places that were at the heart of the action. So until the next time we meet, enjoy your history.